In terms of what's happening to Julian Assange of WikiLeaks, what's happening between the Ecuadorian embassy, London, the United States, Julian Assange is being extradited for sharing information, uh, distributing information for humans and for people from the United States and all across the world. At the same time, this week, the IMF is uh, discussing and saying how startups and big technology companies entering the banking sector are going to need to be regulated because of their forceful entry and because of startups and big technology's ability to uh, prevent or disrupt what the banking sector is doing. Christine Lagarde goes on to say that uh, they will have to have accountability so that they could be fully trusted. And we couldn't agree more. Let's discuss. Hey everybody, I'm Gary Palmer Jr., you're you, and together we are Minting Coins, your trusted source for crypto news, interviews, and what's happening inside the digital security, digital privacy, and blockchain technology space. Well, in today's news, there's just a lot happening at the end of this week. There's a lot happening in the world. There's a lot happening in regards to things related to uh, the past, the present, and future of cryptocurrency, of trust, of relationships, and how we're affected in this larger system, this larger matrix that, you know, for better or for worse, whether it's real or not, perception is nine tenths of reality. And uh, this is the world that we live in. These are the hands that we give. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, why don't we jump real quick into the markets before we get into the news? Take a peek at Bitcoin over at livecoinwatch.com. We have Bitcoin hovering around 5,000, over $5,000 per coin. You know, just 17.6 million of them out there in circulation. Many million of those Bitcoin lost. And, uh, you know, we have Ethereum, XRP, Bitcoin Cash, EOS, Litecoin, Binance Coin, Tether, Stellar, and Cardano rounding out the top 10. So we have Bitcoin here. We have Bitcoin, which is uh, BTC. We have a fork of Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin Cash. Uh, we know that Roger Ver led the uh, forking, um, really uh, you know, supported and got behind Bitcoin Cash, has been a big supporter of Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin.com is owned by Roger Ver and Bitcoin Cash. Uh, Roger Veer has done a lot of good for this world. He uh, has spoken a lot of truth against, um, you know, the, the larger governments and organizations which have really held people back, which have really used taxes and inflation and have taken that money and have used it for this international industrial war machine. And uh, to that regard, we have a lot of respect for Roger and uh, the, the, the truth that he has told and the information that he has shared. Uh, Bitcoin Cash, though, is not Bitcoin. Bitcoin.com uh, really does a lot to mislead people into thinking that Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin when, you know, uh, the people who fall for that trap are going to be sadly disappointed uh, when, you know, this other Bitcoin, Bitcoin BTC, really skyrockets, really takes over. And why is it going to take over? It's because, you know, not because that it's faster. It's not because it's cheaper. It's because Bitcoin BTC is the most decentralized. It's because it's the truest to the original Bitcoin. It's the truest to the, you know, 95% of all the nodes in the world that are running, all the people that are holding all of the uh, infrastructure that is happening is around Bitcoin BTC, right? Bitcoin BTC as created by the original Satoshi Nakamoto. And uh, that, Satoshi, that Satoshi went wildly out of his, her, or their way to keep their anonymity, to keep their identity, to keep their you know, background completely private, right? They didn't want any interviews. They didn't want any fame. They didn't want any attention because they knew the risks. They understood the rewards and uh, they didn't want the consequences of being that first person through the door, right? They didn't want, you know, the arrows in their back uh, to happen to them what essentially happened to people like Charlie Shrem or people like 
uh, you know, Ross Ulbrich or other people who got into uh, a, a technology, a revolution too early before it became cool, before it became financially viable, before, you know, institutional backers, you know, started recognizing what's happening inside that revolution. Because don't forget, even with the birth of America, you know, presidents and uh, the parents of presidents of the United States backed both sides of the world war, right? They backed both sides. So no matter who would win, they would be on the winning side. You know, Democrats and Republicans, access versus allied, dollars versus Bitcoin, the really smart, really wealthy, really connected, uh, you know, diversify. And they have a little bit of their chips in each of their baskets because they're looking for long-term wealth, long-term sustainability, and they're not interested in necessarily the revolution. The point here is that with Bitcoin, you know, where we are now is that Bitcoin is the most decentralized and governments and organizations, corporations, even banks around the world are backing Bitcoin because they recognize that there's no third party and it's very difficult to take down and uh, they can have control of that transfer. They can pay much lower fees than normal and have much greater security in, you know, the tangibility of Bitcoin versus, you know, the faith they have in the tangibility of the U.S. dollars, right? Or the Bolivian dollars or, you know, the boulevards or any of the money that gets thrown out and across to the street. Um, and this is really relevant to the news right now because one of the big things that we're seeing in Twitter and crypto Twitter and what's happening is that Craig Wright and Calvin Ayer are suing lots of people uh, and, uh, you know, probably against the lawyers advisors. The You know, you have Peter McCormick here who uh, runs the What Bitcoin Did podcast and received these letters from the attorney from Craig Wright. Uh, and uh, call, you know, it really shows people what's being said. And basically this person, uh, Craig Wright, who is not Satoshi Nakamoto, is going out there saying that he is Satoshi Nakamoto when all they got to prove to, all you got to do to prove that you're Satoshi is to send a transaction, right? If you're the NSA or if you were able to compromise, you know, Satoshi and you're able to send any transaction from any of the Bitcoin that he or she or they ever mind, then you could easily say or prove that, you know, you may <laughs> very well be Satoshi. All Craig has to do that is to do that. He has not done that. Um, and it just doesn't make sense that after going so far out of the, you know, Satoshi's way to keep Satoshi's identity hidden, that, you know, Satoshi would come back and file these patents and, you know, and try to claim these patents and try to claim this identity and try to claim this fame and try to devise a community and try to, you know, do all the exact opposite things that the original Satoshi had sought to do. So if you want to take a peek at this letter, if you want to go into the comments and read what's happening uh, into, uh, you know, this case and find out more about how Satoshi Nakamoto uh, is not Craig Wright, then uh, you can go in and check that out. But uh, in other people who you may or may not know, this person right here, this is Julian Assange. So Julian uh, is someone who has given private information, secret information on corporations and governments. And they've taken that information and have given it for free uh, to the people, to the media, to other reporters around the world to report on uh, what's happening that by, from corporations and governments that they don't want the people to know. And these have been major revelations of things that have been happening in you know, different wars uh, across the world uh, to what uh, the NSA is doing in terms of you know, the spying situation on every single um, uh, person in the world. Uh, I was going to say every person in America, but every person in America and the rest of the world. And now Julian Assange has been arrested. Uh, they're calling him a criminal for sharing information, for helping uh, whistleblowers um, get information to report on crimes that uh, governments and corporations are committing. And this over here is Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and Mark Zuckerberg gives your private information to corporations and governments, and he does it for money, and the media calls him the man of the year. Um, so... Uh, Julian Assange has been arrested. So this happened Thursday, April 11th. Assange was arrested at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. 
and he's now facing two counts of charges. The first is a federal case brought to him by the U.S. government over leaked government documents through his WikiLeaks website. And so WikiLeaks is a website that whistleblowers use to uh, help get out the word of the information that they, you know, risk their um, freedom for, right? Uh, because they think it's more, their freedom is less important than the importance of getting this information out to the world so the world knows what is happening. So the U.S. federal government has been waiting to lay its hand down on Julian for over seven years since he fled the U.S. jurisdiction uh, to the Ecuadorian embassy in London, ending up there. And what's happening is that Julian shared all this information about the massive uh, leaks from uh, everything that the governments have been doing from, you know, before 2010 uh, and, and even to present day, you know, really upsetting people from, you know, the Bush administration and uh, the, 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 you know, the, the Clinton administration and uh, the Obama administration and now the Trump administration just upsetting everybody. Um, and so everyone in the United States government does not like this because the United States government and major corporations don't like their secrets shared uh, because it's, it's bad for business. And so Julian Assange, you know, his connection to Bitcoin is that way back when, when, you know, PayPal and Visa and all of those companies started uh, putting pressure uh, on, you know, on themselves from the government to shut down Julian Assange's and WikiLeaks ability to receive payments. That's when they started using uh, Bitcoin. That was way back in 2010 before Bitcoin even really had a price, you know, before it had uh, any sort of um, any any real value uh, that was being you know really watched by markets that were you know recording data right it's really hard to find uh, Bitcoin price data for 2011. Uh, there's this quote here where he said, "My deepest thanks to the U.S. government, Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman for pushing Visa, Mastercard, PayPal, Amex, money brokers, ETAL into erecting an illegal banking blockade against WikiLeaks starting in 2010. It's be it's caused us to invest in Bitcoin with greater than 50,000% return. And so even with Julian Assange's arrest, you know, he probably has some secret Bitcoin wallets out there with uh, some significant amounts of Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, who knows what other pieces of information locked up and put out there. So what this comes down to is that, uh, you know, people don't realize, or maybe with this case, people are going to start to realize more and more that exposing illegal information that the government has been doing is illegal. And this is something that everyone needs to know about, right? This is something that anyone out there who shares information that the government doesn't want you to share, this, this creates a precedent where you could get your freedoms taken away. You could have charges brought against you. You can get um, you know, thrown in jail and have fines put against you. So maybe the government doesn't want you at some point learning about you know, Bitcoin or learning about financial freedom or learning about internet freedom or learning about digital privacy or learning about digital security. Maybe not necessarily the United States, but this creates a precedent for all other countries around the world to point to the United States and say that the United States did this. So those, those countries can there, you know, these other countries can do it as well. This creates, uh, um, you know, a very sad day, a very dark day for the freedom of press and the freedom of people everywhere. And freedom is an interesting thing because when freedom is taken away, it doesn't come back, right? Freedoms that we have, we're all fought for. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult. You know, it, it, it costs a lot to gain freedoms back, but they so easily, you know, fade away from us. So related or unrelated, uh, you might find this interesting that the very same week that the Ecuadorian em uh, embassy, uh, you know, revoked the asylum for Julian Assange, the very same week that the, the, the police of London go in to arrest Julian Assange and, you know, for extradition to the United States is the very same week that the IMF executive board approves $4.2 billion dollars in extended funding for Ecuador. And so the board's decision, uh, which happens this week, enables the immediate disbursement of $652 million 
right? $652 million is, a, is immediately paid this week to Ecuador. Now, uh, nothing to do with, you know, Julian Assange losing his, uh, you know, uh, asylum in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy, but it just so happens the very same week Julian Assange loses his asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy, Ecuador receives $4.2 billion over the next couple of years with $652 million paid immediately. So that was the cost of uh, Julian Assange's freedom. That was the price of uh, the freedom of press was, uh, was a low, low fee of, of, of that much. So what else happens with this money in Ecuador? Well, it's going to be strengthening the institutional foundations of Ecuador's dollarization for Ecuador's dollarization and to, um, you know, creating a strong financial, you know, central banking system based on, uh, you know, U.S. dollars and, and uh, Keynesian economics. Uh, so there's a quote here, it goes on to say, this is from the IMF, that uh, building crisis preparedness capabilities and strengthening the oversight of banks uh, to further, you know, the dollarization supported by the authorities and working underway to improve the targeting of social programs, uh, particularly in schools. So this is just really interesting. It's really how this is connected. It's really how money plays a big role. It's really how information is illegal. It's really how money is illegal. It's really how uh, the, the systems that are structured have you know, really created a lot of instability for the majority of people, for the people who are working every day, while creating a lot of stability for the people who are printing the dollars.